Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. It's been called the most dangerous threat to American sovereignty, an anti-human document which takes aim at Western culture and the Judeo-Christian and Islamic religions that'll bring new dark ages of pain and misery yet unknown to mankind and abolish golf courses, grazing pastures, and paved roads in the name of creating a one-world order. It's been the subject of several forewarning books and DVDs. There are organizations dedicated to stopping it, and politicians have been unseated for supporting it. Conservative radio talk show hosts spend hours making people scared of it. Not sure what it is? You're not alone. What is the United Nations Agenda 21? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… She is said to have wings and two souls. She can form into the shape of an owl at will. She usually haunts churches, towers, and barns. We'll look at the vampiric demon named Strix. Is it possible that you are, without even knowing it, reacting to the energy around you in a way others don't? Could you be clairsentient? Some believe the secretive society known as the Freemasons are so powerful and influential that they have members in all branches of the government, in almost all countries around the world. Is it possible, then, that they could make an outspoken critic of the society inexplicably disappear? The murder of Jennifer Pan's mother and attempted murder of her father was not an explosive act of violence. It was a pre-planned, orchestrated hit designed for maximum effect. How and why would a 24-year-old do such a horrific thing? But first, what exactly is the Agenda 21 conspiracy? We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The Daily Beast got a sneak peek at a 2017 report by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a nonprofit civil rights group which deconstructs the mythology of Agenda 21 and the organizations, individuals, and even elected officials who spent years promulgating the conspiracy theory surrounding it. Before diving into the fiction that has inflated Agenda 21 to fear-mongering status, we must first understand the facts. What exactly is Agenda 21. While the name might sound a bit ominous, Agenda 21 is a voluntary action plan that offers suggestions for sustainable ways local, state, and national governments can combat poverty and pollution and conserve natural resources in the 21st century. That's where the 21 comes from. 178 governments, including the U.S., led by then-President George H.W. Bush, voted to adopt the program, which is again not legally binding in any way, at the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro. It wasn't long after Agenda 21 was introduced that right-wing opposition began to swirl. The SPLC points to Tom DeWeese as one of the first to pounce on the UN plan. In 1998, DeWeese founded the American Policy Center, a group based in Remington, Virginia that focuses on environmental policy and its effect on private property rights and the United Nations and its effect on American national sovereignty. 
The SPLC report quotes DeWeese as describing Agenda 21 as a blueprint to turn your community into a little Soviet promoted by non-governmental organizations that pressure governments to enforce it. According to DeWeese, it all means locking away land, resources, higher prices, sacrifice and shortages, and is based on the age-old socialist scheme of redistribution of wealth. DeWeese has continued to deride the dangers of Agenda 21 well into the 21st century, making appearances on Fox News and fitting in nicely with the Tea Party movement. The American Policy Center was just the first of many anti-Agenda 21 organizations to spring up in the past 15 or so years, and the SPLC points out the 11 most pervasive. To those who don't closely follow the carryings-on of fringe conspiracists, Glenn Beck might be the most recognizable face of the modern Anti-21 movement. Particularly during his time at Fox News, Beck used his cable TV soapbox to scare his loyal viewers. Those pushing government control on a global level have mastered the art of hiding it in plain sight and then just dismissing it as a joke, the SPLC quotes Beck saying around 2011, while waving a copy of the 294-page Agenda 21 document on his show. Once they put their fangs into our communities and suck all the blood out of it, we will not be able to survive. Never one to miss an opportunity to cash in on people's fears, Beck published a dystopian science fiction novel in 2012 called Agenda 21, about a version of America where mating partners are arranged, children are raised away from their parents in group homes, and the book's heroine spends hours walking on a sort of treadmill that generates energy in an apartment in a planned community. In the book's afterward, Beck warns, if the United Nations, in partnership with radical environmental activists and naive local governments, get their way, then the themes explored in this novel may start to look very familiar very quickly. But while Glenn Beck can technically be dismissed as nothing more than a fringe figure, the elected officials who have taken a similarly strong stance against Agenda 21 cannot. In the report, the SPLC points out Newt Gingrich, who said he would explicitly repudiate the plan if elected president during his 2012 White House bid. Oklahoma Senator Sally Kern and Arizona State Senator Judy Burgess, who both introduced anti-Agenda 21 legislation that ultimately failed, and former Georgia Senate Majority Leader Chip Rogers, who organized a four-hour closed-door anti-Agenda briefing in October 2012 during which attendees were told President Obama was using mind control techniques to push land use planning, and that the UN planned to force Americans from suburbs into cities, and also was implementing mandatory contraception to curb population growth. U.S. Senator Ted Cruz has claimed that Agenda 21 sought to abolish golf courses, grazing pastures, and paved roads. And as recently as 2012, the SPLC writes, the Republican National Committee's platform included the line, We strongly reject the UN Agenda 21 as erosive of American sovereignty. Several anti Semitic neo Nazi groups have also jumped on the anti Agenda 21 bandwagon, seizing the opportunity to blame the controversial document on none other than the Jews. Anti Semitism is basically a conspiracy theory, the American Jewish Committee's Ken Stern told the SPLC. He explains how neo-Nazis have linked Agenda 21 to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a falsified document that is alleged to reveal a secret Jewish plot to take over the world. It's Jews conspiring to harm non-Jews, and that conspiracy explains a lot of what's going wrong with the world," Stern said. To be sure, not all of Agenda 21's opponents are on the far right of the political spectrum. The group Democrats Against UN Agenda 21 hosted a conference on the plan in California in 2011. Its founder, self-described lesbian feminist Rosa Coyer, wrote the book Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21, which claims the plan will ultimately lead to the U.S.'s economic demise. In fact, the anti-Semitic crowd's interest in the Agenda 21 conspiracy theory sort of explains why it appeals to all of its followers, regardless of political leanings. Anytime you get some sort of UN program that suggests any kind of change in the way people live, even if it seems outwardly benign and even voluntary, it's going to be taken up by people with a conspiracist bent. Michael Barkin, a Syracuse University political scientist and scholar of conspiracy theories, told the SPLC 
At this point in the explanation, it bears asking whether any of this matters. Is the federal government or any state of local subsidiaries even considering implementing any of the planned suggestions for sustainable development? The SPLC report states plainly, for all the agitation, it's not clear. 98% of people who responded to a June 2012 poll by the American Planning Association say they didn't know about Agenda 21 to support or oppose it. 6% said they were against it, while 9% stated that they were in favor. The SPLC does note that some politicians, like Chattanooga, Tennessee Mayor Ron Littlefield, have denounced the anti-Agenda 21 conspiracists as modern-day Joseph McCarthy's, who will finally tire the public with their scare tactics. Still, they write, an enormous number of politicians, commentators, activists, conspiracy theorists, and others have swallowed the story of the anti-Agenda 21 zealots, making any kind of rational discussion of the environment and related issues extremely difficult. And that is the basic problem, the report continues. Dealing with the serious problems that confront our nation and our planet becomes incredibly difficult when the public discussion is poisoned with groundless conspiracy theories. I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. In this case, I wholeheartedly approve. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I have no idea how they accomplished that. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. I don't crash after four or five hours when it wears off because it doesn't. It builds up in my system to give me consistent focus, clearer thought, energy without being jittery, and like I said, motivation. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. And they even give five cents from every bottle sold to help those who are homeless. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. Because I just love what it's doing for me. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and get started. That's magicmind.com slash darkness. And at checkout, use the code DARKNESS for up to 40% off your first subscription or 20% off your one-time purchase. That's only for a limited time, though, so you're going to want to jump on this. It's magicmind.com slash darkness, and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. In Slavic mythology, a specific winged demon is called Sturzaiga, or in many cultures, Strix, as we will call her. Rarely known in the male form, Strix is somewhat similar to a vampire. In the Greco-Roman beliefs, a witch was called a Strix, who took the form of a bird under the cover of night. In beliefs of classic antiquity, the Strix was a bird of bad omen. According to some accounts, this ominous large-headed bird had a human face, human fingers that were curved like claws, grayish white bat wings, yellow transfixed eyes, 
four legs and a long, voracious beak which was used to suck the blood of its victims or fed on their bodies. Her breath was believed to be poisoned, and her victims were most often sleeping infants. But among ancient Greeks and Romans, this malevolent creature fed more often on spiritual vitae, the life force or literally breath of life of the victim. A cemetery was believed to be the creature's favorite place, where its crying was usually heard at nighttime. The souls of people who were born with two hearts, two souls, and a double row of teeth are left to be stalked. They usually become the Strixes. In the first life, they are mostly harmless and not much different from other people, because their second row of teeth is almost invisible. Later, when their true destiny comes out, they suffer because of their otherness. In Slavic beliefs, the Strix usually dies at a young age, but when one soul leaves, the other survives to begin hunting. Many of them can turn into owls. They are lonely hunters, do not join others living in clusters, and have no other desires than to satisfy hunger. Sometimes they want revenge for the harm they suffered in their first life. It was possible to defend against the Strix by hanging branches of hawthorn in the window, sprinkling the threshold with water, or giving it to drink the blood of a pig, a substitute for child's blood. The creature could be recognized by the characteristic blue glow that surrounded its body at night. Their victims could be recognized by the fact that the left eye always remained open and immobile. The ancient Romans believed that their goddess, Carna, patron of the door, was also a divine babysitter and a protector who, by means of magical spells, chased away the Strix. When the Strix occasionally appeared in the church tower at night, this ominous bird heralded an imminent death to all who were within her sight. In later folklore, dated the 16th century, these demonic creatures used to attend a witch's Sabbath, where they fought with each other. If an accidental mortal strayed in the area and witnessed such a fight, he ended up being beaten and with the arrival of dawn losing his memory of the whole event or losing his speech. Along with sunrise or with the early morning ringing of church bells, they had to end their night activities and go back to abandoned houses to deal with weaving, spinning wool, and sewing linen shirts for themselves. If they had not left at the appointed time, they were supposed to crumble in half and lose their powers, similar to vampires when their powers are often limited during the day or in daylight. Also, Stikini, or man-owl in ancient folklore of the Seminole Indians of Oklahoma, had to return back before dawn because sunlight had disastrous consequences for the creature's supernatural abilities to turn back into human shape. Likewise, the all-knowing dwarf, Elvis, in Norse mythology, who forgot that his kind could never face the light of day, disappeared. Up next, is it possible that you are, without even knowing it, reacting to the energy around you in a way others don't? Could you be clairsentient? And some believe the secretive society known as the Freemasons are so powerful and influential that they have members in all branches of government in almost all countries around the world. Is it possible, then, that they could make an outspoken critic of the society unexplainedly disappear? These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. As most already know, everything around us is energy. Even if we cannot see it most of the time, it's possible we may have a greater ability to control energy than we're aware of. Our senses are also more powerful than most suspect. Aristotle, the father of Western philosophy, claimed that humans have only five senses, and he was credited with the traditional classification of the five senses' organs – sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. The myth of the five senses persists, even though Aristotle was wrong. Modern scientists have proven humans can have between 9 and 21 senses in total. If there's so much energy around us and we have so many senses, it's fair to ask if some of us can be clairsentient without knowing it. People who are clairsentient feel energy more than others, which is why they're sometimes exhausted after spending time in large groups or being in crowds. Clairsentient people 
pick up bad and good energy, and that can make them very tired at times. Is it really possible to sense energy? Scientists have long been skeptical about the subject, but it seems the first evidence of the perception of good and bad energy is slowly emerging. Researchers have investigated the human capacity to communicate fear, stress, and anxiety via body odor from one person to another. It's known that many animal species transmit information via chemical signals, but the extent to which these chemo signals play a role in human communication has long been a mystery. Many people are convinced it's possible that humans can sense good and bad energy from a place or other people, but conclusive scientific evidence is still missing. On the other hand, some years ago the term energy vampires was dismissed as pure nonsense, and today there are more and more researchers who suggest that many may have had encounters with beings who steal energy from a person, leaving the victim more or less exhausted. Clairsentience is a psychic ability that has not been confirmed by science, but it doesn't imply it's unreal. Our mind and brain remain greatly unexplored, and there is still so much we need to learn about our unknown abilities. People who are clairsentient can sense others' moods, feelings, motives, and intentions with no logical explanation. A clairsentient can meet a complete stranger and feel his or her emotional state without knowing anything about the person's background or life story. This experience can make a clairsentient overwhelmed because he picks up so much energy. Clairsentience often goes hand-in-hand hand with empathy. Clairsentient people avoid reading or listening to the news because they can feel the pain and sadness of those who have been through something terrible like a natural disaster or loss of a loved one. Basically, they feel the same physical and emotional pain as the victim, and sometimes even more. The clairsentient person can walk into a room and suddenly become sad without no apparent reason because he can sense the energy around him. One can say clairsentience is a bit like the sixth sense, giving awareness not explicable in terms of normal perception. The only clairsentience is based on sensing energy from everything and everyone around you. You may be clairsentient even without knowing it. Many people who possess this extraordinary ability don't understand why they feel the way they do around other people. For example, having strong gut feelings can be a sign you are a clairsentient person. Does it sound impossible? Maybe we simply don't know all the secrets of our psychic abilities. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. William Morgan was a resident of Batavia, New York. He was also a bricklayer and stonemason, and was married with a wife and two children. In addition, Morgan was friends with David C. Miller, a local newspaper publisher who was attempting to keep his paper afloat. Because Morgan was indigent, he hit on a plan to write a book that he would publish through Miller. Morgan plotted to expose the secrets of Freemasonry, a fraternal society that had become influential in the United States after some of the earliest known lodges were established in Pennsylvania in 1715. 
Freemasonry was popular in the 18th century and grew dramatically by the 1800s. Many well-known people became Freemasons. For instance, in France, people such as the Duke de Orleans, his wife, and his sister-in-law, the Princess de la Belle, joined. It was the same in America, where three of the most famous Freemasons of the 18th century were George Washington, Paul Revere, and Benjamin Franklin. Unlike those who wanted to be Freemasons, Morgan joined under false pretenses so that he could gain access to the Society's secret ceremonies and rituals. In 1826, he then threatened to expose these secrets by publishing a book through Miller. Once word leaked out about what he planned to do, though, it excited great commotion among Freemason members. Supposedly, members living in and around Batavia were particularly upset and consultations were had among them respecting the means which should be adopted to prevent the publication of the contemplated work. It was initially reported that Freemason members decided to try and persuade William Morgan to abandon the idea of the book. When that didn't work, advice was given to him in the hopes that he would change his mind. That didn't work either, which then supposedly resulted in a dishonorable plan by Freemasons. Arrangements were made for the assembling at Batavia on the night of the 8th of September of members of the fraternity from different and distant places. It is distinctly proved that a party of 15 or 20 persons from Buffalo and its vicinity assembled at a tavern about four miles west of Batavia in the afternoon and evening of that day. They remained there until 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening when they went toward Batavia. At the same time, a party came to Batavia from Lockport and its vicinity. It is in proof that this party was composed of persons, some of whom had been selected for the express purpose to assist in measures to suppress the book and to separate William Morgan from the individual who was printing it, voluntarily if possible, forcibly if necessary. Allegedly, it was not just the suppression of Morgan's work that was being contemplated by the Freemasons. It seems Morgan had borrowed a shirt and cravat from Ebenezer C. Kingsley who then filed a charge on the 10th of September claiming that Morgan had taken away those items. Kingsley's allegation resulted in a warrant being issued for Morgan, who was arrested in Batavia, put on a stagecoach, and taken to Canandaigua, about 50 miles east of Batavia. Morgan then went before a Canandaiguan judge but was discharged. Another warrant was then applied for by Nicholas G. Chesbro against Morgan for a debt of about $2 related to a tavern bill that he had contracted with Aaron Ackley, which Chesbro alleged had since been assigned to him. A judgment of $2.69 was then brought against Morgan, and he was returned to the jail at Canandaigua that same evening on the 11th of September, 1826. He remained in jail until the next evening. On that night, according to the jailer's wife, a Mrs. Hall, her husband, Israel R. Hall, was absent when, after dark, Lawton Lawson, a mason, arrived at the jail. He asked if William Morgan was there, and after being told that he was, Lawson said he wanted to pay Morgan's debt and take him away. Mrs. Hall claimed she gave Lawson some excuse that she couldn't release him, so Lawson asked to speak with Morgan in his cell, and she walked with him there. Lawson then asked Morgan if he would leave with him if he paid the debt, and Morgan said yes. Lawson then tried to get Mrs. Hall to take the money, but she refused. Lawson left to find her husband. However, being unable to find him, and Lawson returned with a man who called himself Foster, but who was really John Sheldon. Lawson told Mrs. Hall that he had three dollars more than the amount owed. He tried to pay Mrs. Hall, but once again, she refused to accept the money. He and Sheldon went away. Lawson then returned and was even more insistent that she let Morgan go. She again refused. So Lawson went away, and this time came back with a Colonel Edward Sawyer who advised her to take the money and let Morgan go, but she still refused. Lawson then sought out and found Chesbro. After the two conversed, Chesbro approached Mrs. Hall and told her that Lawson was anxious to liberate Morgan and that she should let him go. She therefore agreed, got the keys, and went to Morgan's cell, freeing him. The men then left in a friendly manner, but she reported that before she could get the door of Morgan's room locked, she heard the cry of, Murder! and rushed to the front door. According to the Middlebury Free Press, she then observed the following. Lawson, Morgan, and Sheldon on the side, a short distance from the steps of the jail, going to the east. Morgan was in the middle and evidently struggling to get free. His hat was off and he was struggling to get away. 
The other two had hold of him by his arms and to all appearance were dragging him along. While they were passing on to the east, she heard a rap on the curb of the well, about the same time heard the cry of murder once or twice. After learning that William Morgan had left jail, attempts were made to find him, but he never turned up anywhere. His disappearance therefore ignited a firestorm and his name was soon on everyone's lip. Moreover, it created such worry in Batavia that public meetings were called, inquiries instituted, and measures adopted to ascertain the actors in the scene of apparent and deep iniquity. Eventually, authorities charged four men with conspiracy to seize and carry William Morgan from the jail. They were Lawson, Sheldon, Sawyer, and Chesbro. A trial was set, but before it could begin, the excitement in the local area was great. The overwhelming interest in the case was noted by the Fayetteville Weekly Observer that reported, "...the taverns are crowded to excess with counsel, witnesses, and those whom curiosity has drawn hither. A number of persons whose presence is necessary to the dispatch of business have yet to arrive." but unless they obtain accommodation in private families, they're not likely to be very pleasantly situated. From the hotel where this is written, Blossoms, about 70 applicants were turned away since Sunday, the house being crowded to overflowing. Hence, you may guess what a host of sojourners the business of the court has attracted. When the trial opened, there were numerous witnesses that testified. However, it was William Morgan's wife who opened the trial. She stated that she had not seen her 52-year-old husband since he left the Canandaigua jail. Richard Wells, a local man, testified that he was in the area when Morgan was being led away. He claimed that he was about 110 yards west of the jail when he heard a cry for help. When he stopped to listen closer, he heard a second cry, but by the time he arrived at the jail, there was no noise. He then saw Chesbro and mentioned that he heard a man cry. Chesbro claimed that the man had been released but had reason to be arrested again, and that was why he cried out. Willis Turner, who lived in the Canandaiguan area, also reported seeing several men with a struggling man, William Morgan. Turner recounted one of the men cried, murder, three times. He also noted that he saw a scuffle happen between the men and that Morgan's hat fell off. Turner also reported that he witnessed Chesbro put a handkerchief over Morgan's mouth saw a two-horse carriage stop, observed Morgan forcibly put into the carriage along with several men, and watched as the carriage drove off. Hiram Hubbard, who was a mason and the driver of the carriage seen by Turner, claimed to have been asked to drive a party to Rochester. He testified that about five men got into his carriage when he stopped to pick them up near the jail. He then drove to Rochester where he watered his horses while the men took refreshments. He eventually let his passengers out in the road near Ridge Road and the woods. He reported that nothing passed between him and his passengers, he saw nothing suspicious, and that Chesborough paid him some months later for the carriage ride. Although people might have hoped that the trial would help determine what happened to Morgan, it didn't. In fact, the trial in some ways made it more confusing because there were conflicting accounts about what happened next. The most accepted version is that William Morgan was taken in a boat to the middle of the Niagara River, thrown overboard, and presumably drowned as he was never seen again. A second version is that Morgan was paid a large sum to give up the publication of his Freemason book and disappeared into some foreign land. Both of these suggestions were also noted in the Fayette Weekly Observer. Quote, the trial of the Masons for the abduction of Morgan is progressing. The fate of Morgan is yet a matter of profound and deeply interesting mystery. The better opinion is that he was delivered into the hands of a party of traders near Niagara in Canada and by them carried to the Northwest yet serious fears are entertained that he has been murdered." Unquote. The scandal of Morgan's disappearance and the trial created such an uproar some people quit Freemasonry, which then resulted in about 2,000 lodges closing. It also inspired Thurlow Weed, a New York newspaper publisher and politician, and others to harness the discontent against the Freemasons with the founding of a new political party, the Anti-Masonic Party. In addition, anti-Masons were of course critical of the trial and the Masons who testified during it. It is with unmingled emotions of shame and disgust that we peruse the testimony given in this trial. Most of the witnesses were Masons who felt the cable toe of their Masonic oaths pressing hard against their throats at every word they uttered, and every fact that was drawn from them came out like a tooth, painfully and reluctantly, qualified with and I don't know, can't relect distinctly. I suppose it might be so, didn't exactly see such things. 
After the jury returned from their deliberations, they found the accused guilty but sentenced them to rather lenient punishments. These light sentences were noted by the Buffalo Emporium and General Advertise. Lowton Lawson was sentenced to two years' imprisonment, Nicholas G. Chesborough to one year's imprisonment, John Sheldon to three months' imprisonment, and Edward Sawyer to one month's imprisonment, all in the country jail. The lenient punishment caused public outrage, and as there was no conclusive evidence as to what happened to William Morgan, on the 15th of April, 1828, a legislative act was passed to allow the New York governor to institute inquiries by establishing a special counsel to investigate Morgan's abduction. A special prosecutor was also appointed to bring the perpetrators to justice, and in 1830, a report by the special counsel was provided that outlined their findings. The special counsel also reported on the attempts made by the Freemasons to stop Morgan from publishing his book, and they mentioned the allegations brought by Kingsley and Chesbro against Morgan. In addition, Eli Bruce, the sheriff of Niagara County and a Mason, had a deputy named Hiram B. Hopkins. He testified that Bruce told him that William Morgan was to be taken from Batavia and sent away. It was thought then that he would be sent to Niagara through Lockport and Bruce desired him to prepare a cell in the jail for the reception of Morgan, which was prepared accordingly. Soon after Morgan's disappearance, his friend Miller published his book detailing the secrets of Freemasonry. It became a bestseller because of all the hype surrounding the missing Morgan. Miller also maintained that Morgan had been carried away, which of course increased the speculation as to where Morgan might be or exactly what happened to him. Despite Miller's allegations, one group of Freemasons claimed Morgan was not dead and that they had paid him $500 to leave. In addition, there were reports that Morgan was later seen in other countries, although none of these reports were ever confirmed. Interest surrounding Morgan remained relatively high, and that eventually inspired New York Governor DeWitt Clinton, who served between January 1, 1825 to February 11, 1828, and was also a Mason, to offer a $1,000 reward for information about Morgan's whereabouts. The reward was never claimed. In October 1827, a badly decomposed corpse washed up on the shores of Lake Ontario. Many people believed it had to be Morgan's body, and therefore it was buried as his. However, a Canadian named Timothy Monroe, or Munro, was also missing about this same time, and his wife identified the clothing on the body as the same as what her husband had been wearing prior to his disappearance. In the meantime, many people remained suspicious about what happened to Morgan, and rumors circulated that Bruce had been involved in his disappearance. Thus, Bruce was removed from office as sheriff and then tried for being involved in Morgan's disappearance. Around June of 1829, Bruce was found guilty of kidnapping and holding Morgan against his will and sentenced to 28 months in prison. By 1848, Morgan's disappearance still had never been satisfactorily explained, and people continued to demand answers. That's when Henry L. Valance, a Mason, allegedly confessed on his deathbed that he took part in Morgan's murder. He confessed to Dr. John L. Emery, who recorded it and who accordingly reported that Morgan met a watery grave when he was dumped into the rapids of the Niagara River and swept over the falls. Details of exactly what happened were provided by Valance in his confession. He stated that Morgan had meekly accepted his fate. Quote, he made no remonstrances, nor offered any resistance, his demeanor and acts being in all respects those of a man who has nerved himself boldly to meet a certain doom. We bound his hands behind him and placed a gag in his mouth. One of our number marched a few yards in advance and was followed by myself and the other associate, between whom walked Morgan. We each had a hold of one of his arms, above the elbow. A short time brought us where the boat had been placed. The night was pitch dark and we could scarcely see. Having arrived at a place sufficiently removed from the land, the rowers ceased. In the bottom of the boat lay a number of heavy weights, all tied together by a strong cord. This cord I took in my hand and fastened it around the body of Morgan. Then, in a whisper, I bade the unhappy man to stand up, and after a momentary hesitation, Morgan was standing with his back toward me and apparently looking into the water. I approached him and gave him a strong push. He fell forward, carrying the weights with him, and the waters closed over the mass." Unquote. Although some people may have believed Morgan died in the Niagara River in June 1881, 
A grave was discovered on land in a quarry two miles south of an Indian reservation in Pembroke, New York. The discovery resulted in numerous declarations that the remains did not belong to some Indian and that at last William Morgan's body had been found. The Times reported, "...certain bones have been discovered which apparently bear a striking resemblance to the bones which William Morgan may have possessed. The bones were found in the town of Pembroke, which is situated 11 miles west of Batavia." William Morgan lived in Batavia, and the people who are supposed to have spirited him away also lived in Batavia. With them was a silver ring marked W.M. No trinkets were buried with it, and Indians do not wear such silver rings. A tobacco box was discovered, and under its rust-eaten cover was found a letter. Scarcely legible, but these startling words were deciphered with the aid of a microscope. Masons, liar, prison, kill, and the name Henry Brown. Henry Brown being the name of a lawyer who defended the Masons. However, critics claimed that the discovery was too coincidental and that the bones were found at a time when efforts were being expended to erect a memorial to Morgan. Critics maintained that the find of the bones had been staged to generate publicity for the monument. They may have been right because on the 13th of September, 1882, in memory of William Morgan, a monument was erected by the National Christian Association who opposed secret societies. The inscription read, Sacred to the memory of William Morgan, a native of Virginia, a captain in the War of 1812, a respectable citizen of Batavia, and a martyr to the freedom of writing, printing, and speaking the truth. He was abducted from near this spot in the year 1826 by Freemasons and murdered for revealing the secrets of their order. The court records of Genesee County and the files of the Batavia Advocate, kept in the recorder's office, contain the history of the events that caused the erection of this monument. When Weird Darkness Returns The murder of Jennifer Pan's mother and attempted murder of her father was not an explosive act of violence. It was a pre-planned, orchestrated hit designed for maximum effect. How and why would a 24-year-old do such a horrific thing? If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Jennifer Pan case features some unique characteristics within the dark world of parasite. In Ontario, Canada, in 2010, a home invasion became national news. The home of Vietnamese immigrants Beach Ha and Han Pan and their two children, Jennifer and Felix Pan, was invaded by masked men who shot Beach Ha dead and seriously wounded Han Pan. The home invasion caused shock and terror in a normally quiet neighborhood leaving residents in fear brutal robbers were randomly targeting family homes in the area. The reality, however, was an almost unbelievable truth that Jennifer, the Pan's 24-year-old daughter, had arranged for her parents to be killed. As police investigators followed up on inconsistent statements, confusing evidence, and a statement from Han Pan once he awoke from a coma that he believed his daughter was somehow involved, a tangled web of lies 
secret meetings and deadly plans were unearthed. The Jennifer Pan case stands out within Parricide for a number of reasons. Firstly, for a daughter to execute a plan to kill her parents is itself unusual, with the majority of Parricide cases being carried out by male children. Furthermore, Jennifer Pan did not carry out this horrific crime herself. She organized and arranged for so-called friends to do it for her, playing the damsel in distress that needed a release from the prison her parents were keeping her in. After the crime had taken place, Jennifer Pan continued to conceal her guilt by pretending she was also a victim, trying to manipulate police and the rest of her family into believing her lies. Parricide, the murder of a parent or both parents by their own child, is a rare and most devastating act of homicide. It is in many senses the ultimate betrayal. The very people who brought you into this world, nurtured and loved you throughout your life, are repaid by being killed by the person they least expect. Of course, in many of these tragic cases, the loving home ideal has been replaced by a chamber of abuse and torture, leading a child to feel the only escape is to stop their abusers once and for all. However, this was not the case for Jennifer Pan. She did not grow up in a household where abuse and violence were present. Her parents were indeed strict, and her father laid down some harsh ground rules when he discovered his daughter had been deceiving them about her education and whereabouts day after day. Jennifer Pan was the eldest of the Pan's two children and by all accounts a bright, friendly, and happy child. She initially performed well at school, in music, and in sports, and seemed to be a dedicated student, eager to learn and build herself a solid future. The Pans were Vietnamese, and their culture was, as you would expect, a big part of their lives. Han Pan followed the traditional parenting styles within Asian culture where children are pushed to achieve and had high expectations placed on them. While these methods may not mirror those in Western cultures and may be considered harsh and strict to many, it cannot be said that such parenting amounted to abuse. Jennifer Pan began to fall short of the expectations she knew both her parents had of her. Her grades at school fell, and she knew if her parents found out, there would be consequences. Extra tutoring, more study hours, and less free time would inevitably follow until she increased her grades back into the top percentile. Instead of facing this reality, Jennifer Pan decided to lie to her parents and began a cycle of deceit which grew in scale as the months turned into years and she realized just what she could get away with. Forged report cards turned into forged acceptance letters from university. Lies about her activities within school became lies about part-time jobs and work placements all designed to please her parents and ensure they would not look too closely. While her parents believed their daughter had achieved her high school diploma and had been accepted into university, Jennifer Pan was working in a pizza parlor and giving all her time and attention to a boy she had become infatuated with, Daniel Wong, a boy who would eventually stand beside her inside the high court, charged with murder. What is most striking about this case is the length of time between the idea of murder being conceived and the attack being carried out. A period of months passed while decisions were made, details worked out, and plans put in place, but not once during this time did the 24-year-old daughter reflect on what she was planning to do and recognize the brutality of it. This is not a child who snapped after years of abuse or a child who suffered from mental illness, distorting her thoughts and twisting her into sinister plans. The murder of her mother and attempted murder of her father was not an explosive act of violence. It was a pre-planned, orchestrated hit designed for maximum effect. Jennifer Pan, through her relationship with Daniel Wong, who liked to push boundaries and had an involvement in drug dealing, came into contact with men who held few moral values and for whom gaining money was their ultimate aim. Jennifer Pan was in love with Daniel Wong, that young, intense first love that feels overwhelming, and her desire to be with him fueled her anger against her parents for forbidding their love. She had hidden her relationship with Daniel Wong from her parents for up to seven years, and when it did come to light, they did not approve. This story became more complex as Jennifer Pan's account of her involvement and intentions continued to change. In court, in 2014, Jennifer Pan admitted she had tried to hire a man to kill her father, 
but the plan failed when her potential assassin disappeared with the money she paid him. There's no doubt that Daniel Wong was involved in this planning process. Numerous text messages had been sent between the pair all allegedly about the hit. Jennifer later testified in court that the plan was for her to be killed, that she had essentially arranged for her own death in an unusual suicide bid, but once her situation at home improved, she had called it off. She was charged with a cancellation fee by her hired killer, whom she called Homeboy, believed by police to be Lenford Crawford, who she said she was trying to contact just before the attack on her home and had no involvement in what happened that night. A testimony the jury did not believe. Jennifer Pan was convicted in December 2014 of first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to murder, alongside her co-accused, Lenford Crawford, David Milvaganum, and Daniel Wong. The invasion of the Pan family home is believed to have been carried out by Milvaganum and an Eric Carty, with Wong, Crawford, and Pan being the masterminds behind the crime. Eric Carty was originally on trial with the others but ended up in a separate trial after his lawyer became ill. A third man is also thought to have been present in the house that night, a man yet to be identified. It is Cardi who the defense team blamed for the killings, calling him a psychopathic killer who was desperate for cash. Eric Cardi eventually admitted conspiring with Jennifer Pan to have her parents killed and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. A parricide is a unique form of murder due to the intimate and personal relationship between the offender, the child, and the victims, the parents. They are not strangers to each other, victims that can be detached from and not seen as real people with names, families, and their own lives. They are victims the offender knows personally and has most often lived with for the majority of their lives at the time of the offense. In the Jennifer Pan case, Jennifer detached herself from carrying out the murder herself. It appears that at no point in her desire to get rid of her parents did she consider killing them personally. She wanted the deed done, but she wanted to remain innocent in her own eyes by not being the person who delivered the fatal shots. In a study of 11 parricide cases where both parents were killed by their male child by Weissman, Aaron Clow, and Sharma in 2002, published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences, it was found that the common characteristics seen in many homicide cases were not relevant in these cases of parricide. Characteristics such as substance misuse, juvenile violence history, and family criminal backgrounds which often feature in homicides were not key factors in these cases of children killing their parents. Furthermore, in 54% of these cases, the murders occurred because of a long-standing relationship discord or quarrel, and in 45% of the cases, the offender lied about their involvement in the crime trying to conceal their guilt. This study has a limited data set due to parasites and especially double parasites where both parents are killed being so rare. However, the research highlights some significant factors which add to the picture of parasite and those who carry it out. For Jennifer Pan, she did not have a criminal background. There was no substance misuse issues or juvenile violence in her history. No signs of warning factors which could have suggested this young woman would not only become involved in but orchestrate such a violent and vicious attack on her own parents. Each case of parricide, in a sense, is unique, as they are crimes which, thankfully, are rare. The Jennifer Pan case, however, is one which is particularly shocking and highlights just how the girl next door can be anything but what she seems. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. Also on the website, you can find paranormal and horror audiobooks that I've narrated, The Weird Darkness Store. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. All stories in this episode are purported to be true and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Strix the Demon Vampire with Two Souls was written by A. Sutherland for Ancient Pages. Are You Clairsentient is by Cynthia McKenzie for Message to Eagle. The Girl Next Door Who Arranged Her Parents' Murder is by Fiona Guy for Crime Traveler. The Agenda 21 Conspiracy was by Caitlin Dixon for The Daily Beast. 
and The Disappearance of an Anti-Mason was written by Jerry Walton. Weird Darkness theme by Alibi Music. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8a. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. And a final thought from Tony Robbins. The only impossible journey is the one you never begin. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.